You might have already noticed this, but there's a pretty high number of twins in Elden Ring. The more notable ones include the Omen twins Moog and Morgat, along with a pair of Golden Order Zealots that are collectively just known as D. But I don't think any of them are as recognizable as the twin Empyreans known as Mikola and Melania. Mikola, the unalloyed, has one of the most complex stories in the game, even with half of his content being cut before release, and Melania, the Severed, is so central to the plot that you could argue her being the main character of this story. There is an absurd amount of content dedicated to these two, so I'll try my best to compile it all chronologically, starting with the circumstances of their birth. And as a quick heads up, there will be spoilers ahead. Elden Ring's use of the word Empyrean is often a source of confusion. This Greek word usually describes a place in the highest heaven occupied by the element of fire, but in the context of Elden Ring, it refers to someone that has achieved some sort of godlike status. Queen Merica, the proclaimed god and founder of the Golden Order, is the most notable example, but this title also applies to Rani the Witch, who is one of the many demigod offspring of Merica, and the Glomide Queen, the mysterious leader of the Godskin Apostles. The two fingers seem to decide who can receive this title, with each recipient being given some sort of godlike responsibility. Let us speak of the past a while. I was once an Empyrean, chosen as a candidate to succeed Queen Marika. In an unexpected turn of events, Rani rejected her role as Empyrean, and among Marika's demigod offspring, only she was deemed worthy of this title. That is, until the birth of Mekala and Melania. You see, the demigods can all be split into three categories. The first group is made of those descended from Queen Merica and Lord Godfrey, the first Elden Lord. The second group includes the children of Queen Renala and Lord Radigan, who is revealed to be Merica's secret alternate persona. The third, final category applies to the children born of Merica's second marriage to Radigan, her own alter ego. I can't really explain the logistics of that within this video. Only two characters fall under this, being Mikola and Melania, and they too were supposedly chosen by the Fingers. Of the demigods, only I, Mikola, and Melania could claim that title. Each of us was chosen by our own two fingers to become the new god of the coming age. One item description helps clarify that it was the circumstances of their birth that qualified the twins of this title. Mikola and Melania are both the children of a single god. As such, they are both Empyreans, but suffered afflictions from birth. One was cursed with eternal childhood, who became known as Mikola, and the other harbored Rot Within, who we know to be Melania. While the source of Mikola's curse isn't made clear, Melania's Rot is suggested to be from a powerful outer god, one that's represented by the imagery of a scorpion, but, according to legend, was sealed away by a blind swordsman with a flowing sword, only leaving behind a massive lake of scarlet Rot. Despite their conditions, the twins seem to have had a relatively peaceful childhood, Mikola followed in Radigan's footsteps and studied the Golden Order, exchanging incantations with his father as gifts of gratitude. On Melania's side, her scarlet rot began to take its toll over time. Her right arm was the first thing to be lost, and one statue shows Mikola appearing noticeably younger than Melania. At some point, Mikola abandoned his studies of the Golden Order and instead focused on a material that could treat Melania's rot, being unalloyed gold. Anything made from it could resist the effects of the Scarlet Rot, but his primary focus was on a collection of needles that could completely remove the influence of the Outer Gods once completed. Mikola also had another project he was working on around this time. As you may know, the Earth Tree is the source of most life in the Lands Between, and after death, the souls of these creatures return through the Earth Tree's roots. Your soul will return to the Earth Tree in time. Honeyed rays of gold deliver this spirit. But, much like the Golden Order itself, the Earth Tree rejected certain groups and species, notably including those who live in death, the Omen, and the silver-blooded Albinorix. Mikola's answer to this was the Halic Tree, a replacement for the Earth Tree that would be more accepting of outcasts. The Halic Tree would also act as a physical home for these groups, with one royal knight deciding it could be the Albinorix's best chance at salvation. But despite being watered with Mikola's own blood since it was a sapling, the Halic Tree ultimately failed to grow into an Earth Tree. The Haley Tree, now but a husk. It seems those words held weight. Now, ironically enough, it looks like Melania's own scarlet rot has spread throughout the entire Haley Tree, and as you move closer to its roots, the effects of the rot become more apparent. While we're on the subject of the Haley Tree, let's take another look at the statues placed around this area. There's one of a long-haired child, who we can reasonably assume is Mikola, 
then there's the previously mentioned statue of the twins embracing each other, and there's a third statue that depicts Mikola and Melania as children, alongside a character that doesn't quite match anything we've seen before. You might assume that this is Marika or a Radigan, but the long, unbraided hairstyle doesn't line up with either of those characters' usual appearances. Instead, I think this is Godwin the Golden, one of the demigod children born from Marika and Godfrey. As the older half-brother of the twins, it would make sense that they got along, especially since he seems to be among the most sensible demigods that we know of. At least, he was, until the event that became known as the Night of the Black Knives. It happened during the Golden Age of the Erd Tree. Someone stole a fragment of the Rune of Death, and on a bitter night, murdered Godwin the Golden. That was the first recorded death of a demigod in all history, and it became the catalyst. Soon, the Elden Ring was smashed, and thus sprang forth the war known as the Shattering. The demigods, including Mikola and Melania, claimed the broken shards of the Elden Ring and began warring against each other in their pursuit of greater power. Obviously, Mikola's permanent childhood prevented him from joining any major battles, but Melania actually had plans to join the Shattering herself. Her motives for doing so aren't fully explained, but I think one reasonable guess could be that if she and Mikola had control over the Elden Ring, they might be able to ensure that the Halic Tree would eventually flourish. At this point, Melania's rot has progressed enough that she is now missing an arm, a portion of each leg, and both of her eyes. Luckily, Mikola's work with unalloyed gold allowed for the creation of a prosthetic arm, leg, and a full set of armor that could resist the effects of the Scarlet Rot. This was all likely produced by the Lord of the Shaded Castle, whose name I think is pronounced like Mali Marai, or Malay Marai. The sons of the Marais family were all sickly born, so despite the disapproval from other Shaded Castle residents, Malay was probably inspired by Melania's conviction against the Scarlet Rot, which was a legend that he personally believed in. The prosthetic arm in particular is described as a masterwork of craftsmanship, and when Malay embraced it, he claimed to feel the presence of his personal goddess. Now there was just the issue of Melania's eyes, but if you'll remember, it was a blind swordsman that once sealed away the god of Rot. There's one talisman that describes the scene of a heroic tale. Though born into the accursed rot, when the young girl encountered her mentor and his flowing blade, she gained wings of unparalleled strength. Let's loop back around to Mikola for a bit. The events leading up to the Shattering were kickstarted by Godwin's supposed death, but the consequences of the Night of the Black Knives were more complicated than expected. A curse mark was carved into Godwin's body to kill him, but since only half of it was completed before the other half was carved into a separate demigod, Godwin died in soul alone. As his half-dead corpse grew more disfigured, he became the source of all kinds of undead in the lens between, and earned the title of Prince of Death. Oh, Lord Godwin, how oh, my poor sweet lordling should have died a true death. A scion of the Golden Bough, sentenced to live in death. How could such a thing come to be? Also, I think it's worth noting that this character is internally called Godwin's Wet Nurse. A golden epitaph was made to commemorate Godwin's death, and interestingly, it was infused with the humble prayer of a young boy. Oh brother, Lord brother, Please, die a true death. Another weapon, called the Eclipse Shotel, refers to both the Prince of Death and something about the Eclipsed Son of Castle Soul. The details of the Eclipse are pretty foggy, but one resident of Castle Soul can be seen praying to the Frigid Sun, requesting that life be granted to soulless bones. This is a fairly obscure topic that can only really be talked about in videos with a much more speculative nature. But all you really need to know is that the Eclipse just never happened, even with Mikola's involvement and Godwin remained soulless for the foreseeable future. Meanwhile, Melania's army of clean rot knights were celebrated for their undefeated campaign in the Shattering, with one encounter between Melania and Godric the Grafted showing just how powerful Melania was even compared to the demigods. He insulted Melania, lost to her in battle, only to lick her boots rather than die like a man. The Shattering finally culminated in a direct battle between Melania and Radan, the Star Scourge, who was hailed as the mightiest demigod. General Radan, the famed Red Lion and Scourge of the Stars, is a ferocious warrior. 
He fought millennia and her rot to a standstill in the Caelid Wilds to Limgrave's east. This event became known as the Battle of Aeonia. Instead of directly attacking Radon, Melania stabs herself with her own blade, triggering the bloom of a scarlet flower, which rots away Radon's mind and forever changes the nearby landscape. Caelid has been engulfed by the scarlet rot. Even approaching the region is no mean feat. I've heard survivors of Radon's army are still in the wilds, staving off the rot with fire. And if it's true, I suspect Radan is still there as well, in Kaelid. Though, I doubt he much resembles his former self anymore. Right after this battle, Melania was left alive, but unconscious. So one absolute monster of a clean rot knight had to carry her to safety. This knight's name was Finlay, one of the few survivors of the Battle of Aeonia, who, in an unimaginable act of heroism, carried the slumbering demigod Melania all the way back to the Halig Tree. Melania has yet to be seen by the outside world after this, and even the most dedicated scholars are unsure if she has since been consumed by the Scarlet Rot. Now that we're back at the Halig Tree, let's talk about two fairly divisive topics, that being of Saint Trina and the subject of cut content. For Saint Trina, only a handful of items ever even mention their name. The one thing that these items all have in common is that they relate to sleep in some way. Hey, yo, look who fell asleep first. Prank him, John. <laughs> While we never get to see them in action, some people claim to have witnessed Saint Trina's appearance in their dreams. Some say she is a comely young girl, others are sure he is a boy. The only certainty is that their appearance was as sudden as their disappearance. This, along with clear parallels between items like Trina's Lily and Mikola's Lily, all help support the idea that Saint Trina is another identity of Mikola himself. But the nature of their duality still isn't clear. Do both characters have their own mind and soul, just like the relation between Radigan and Merica? Or is Saint Trina just a disguise that Mikola can easily assume due to his childlike appearance? There's not much evidence for either conclusion, and nothing in-game even confirms their shared identity. But one piece of content that's a bit more explicit about this is a questline that never made it into the final game. This quest involved an NPC that had multiple unused names, which included Reeling Rico, Monk Jiko, or just Rico, spelled a little bit differently. After the player met Rico, they would be given Saint Trina's crystal ball and collect dream mist from various creatures in their sleep. Go up to someone sleeping and use it. Any dream mist you collect is sure to fetch a fine price. With this dream mist, you could create dream brew, a type of alcohol that's known to drag people's secrets into the daylight. Oh, a brew, is it? I've never had alcohol before. Perhaps you knew that old E.G. appreciates a good drink. By the end of this quest, Rico discovers the true identity of Saint Trina is in fact Mikola, though I'll get more into the details of that later. Just keep in mind that anything not in the game's full release should be taken with a grain of salt. I mean, the signature yellow hue with a flame of frenzy was once intended to be red. With all that out of the way, we can finally look at how the player's journey fits into all of this. By the time you travel through Limgrave and arrive in Kaelid, the Scarlet Rot has already spread across the region, leaving the entire landscape a sickly red color. Most of the local wildlife has been mutated beyond recognition, and nightmarish creatures have begun spawning from the rot itself. The kindred of rot, who are occasionally just called pests, are now one of the most prevalent species found in Kaelid. And yet, among the countless monstrosities, you might find something that appears… familiar. Who's there? If you are wise, you will leave immediately. My flesh writhes with scarlet rot. It is a curse not to be meddled with by man. Much like what happened with Melania, this character has been infected by the rot, with her right arm being the first thing to be lost. She's mostly unresponsive, but in a nearby, isolated shack, a sage by the name of Gowry can shed some more light on her situation. I need your help to heal a certain young girl. You must find the unalloyed gold needle. It's hidden somewhere in the deep scarlet swamp of Aeonia. This needle is held by one of the Battle of Aeonia veterans, and for this fight, you're provided the option to summon a phantom named Pollyanna, adopted daughter. After a very not-that-fun boss battle, Gowry can mend the broken needle that the boss drops, making it capable of slowing Millicent's infection. Since inserting the needle, the scarlet rot has ceased to writhe. Even the nightmares have abated. 
And now, though I can scarcely believe it myself, I can move as I please. It's all thanks to you. I'm considering leaving. With the needle buried in my flesh, I've started to recall, but dimly, my destiny. My name is Millicent. Ah, we meet again. Now I'm tracing the path Melania took after unleashing the power of the Scarlet Rot during her battle with General Radan in the Caled Wilds. I should like to meet her, this vanished woman. I think she's in the north, in the lands that lie beyond the Erd Tree. As Millicent continues with her travels, the Sage Gowry will reveal more and more about her past. Do you find it peculiar that I would show such concern for the girl? Well, I'm the one that found her, a mere babe in the swamp of Aeonia. She is one of my dear daughters. But the rotting sickness erodes one's memory. I doubt that she remembers the first thing about me. Please make certain that little Millicent goes unharmed. Like her mother, she has the stuff to be a great warrior, but commands only one arm and is yet preciously young. At this point, you can find an extra prosthesis much like Melania's in the possession of House Murray in the Shaded Castle. Are you giving me this arm? <sighs> Thank you. I am in your debt yet again. If the arm serves well enough, it might be possible for me to wield a sword again. Perhaps then I can aid you in battle. Ah, oh, we meet yet again. I'm searching for a fort to the north of the ruins. I heard the master of the fort was given a medallion that allowed him to visit the Halig tree. Indeed, I believe that is where Melania will be found. Millicent's guess turns out to be correct with the medallion being guarded by another war veteran in Castle Sol. This general and his army of no nation were likely entrusted with the medallion for contributing to the Eclipse, since Mikola's Halic Tree would be a perfect new home for them. The one problem is that they were only given half of the medallion that acted as the key. The other half of the medallion fittingly lies with another group of outcasts, the Albanorix, who choose to protect this key with their lives. The whole village is finished. <coughs> I beg you, would you look after this medallion? You must keep it out of the Cursemonger's hands. My legs will soon fade, and with them my life. This is the immovable fate of all Albinorix. With both halves of the secret medallion in hand, the Grand Lift of Rold can now lead to the hidden path to the Hillock Tree. It's kinda snowy. In Rico's questline, he too would travel through the newly opened path along with the player noting that a holy personage was once abducted from these lands. Ah, so the secret medallions led you to the land of the Halig Tree. I'd expect to find Melania there. Well, if the Scarlet Rot hasn't eaten that away completely. But with the Halig Tree as it is, I suppose Mikola must already be. Ah, my apologies. Lost myself for a moment there. The local residents don't seem too happy about your intrusion, and other enemies that reflect the Halic Tree's sickly state increase in number as you approach the massive brace known as Elphail. In both the Halic Tree town and Elphail, every single creature you meet will be hostile. At least, until you run into an old friend. Again we meet. I can only surmise our purposes are aligned. There is something I must return to Melania. The will that was once her own. The dignity. The sense of self that allowed her to resist the call of the Scarlet Rot, the pride she abandoned, to meet Radan's measure. Now, within the Pool of Rot near the base of the tree, you can find two adjacent summoning signs. One prompts you to assist Millicent, while the other gives you the option to challenge her. She is to meet them very soon, her sisters, and when she does, she'll be defeated, surely, and begin to flower. Millicent trusts you, rather deeply in fact, which is why I ask that you side with the sisters and kill Millicent. Sever that trust. Nurtured by betrayal, her bud will flower most vividly. 
When Melania ascends to godhood, Millicent too shall be reborn as a scarlet Valkyrie. I beg of you, kill her with your own two hands. Gowrie's motives are now clearly at least a little sinister, but if you choose to kill him, his body transforms into a kindred of rot. There are countless bests to choose from. We shall meet again as many times as it takes for you to understand. Now you'll have to make your choice. The first option has you team up with the four sisters Mary, Marine, Amy, and Pollyanna. How could you? Is this your true heart? Was I... was it all... for this? The petals of Millicent's bloom are the only thing found in the aftermath, and returning to Sage Gowry only reveals an abandoned corpse. If you instead choose to assist Millicent, you have to fight off all four of her sisters without you or Millicent being killed. Thank you for lending your hand. I feel as if I've been in your debt from beginning to end. With your help, I was able to live as my own person, if only in passing. But this is where things end. I paused to even tell you, but I took out the needle myself. Tell whoever put you up to this that if I am to flower into something other than myself, I would rather rot into nothingness as I am. Please, let me pass alone. This marks the end of Millicent's quest. At least, that's the case for the final version of the game, but we'll swing back around to this in a moment. Just as Gideon, Millicent, and Rico predicted, the Helic Tree still acted as the hideout for Mikola and Melania long after the Battle of Aeonia. I dreamt for so long. My flesh was dull gold, and my blood rotted. Corpse after corpse left in my wake. As I awaited his return, I am Melania. Blade of Mikola. And I have never known defeat. A scarlet flower is all that's left, allowing you to return the unalloyed gold needle and receive Mikola's needle, one of the tools meant to fully sever the influence of the Outer Gods. The whole fight is, in my opinion, pretty incredible, but unfortunately it brings up another divisive topic in the overall story. The Scarlet Aeonia incantation describes how each time the scarlet flower blooms, Melania's rot advances. It has bloomed twice already, and with the third bloom, she will become a true goddess. So the question is, 
did Melania achieve full godhood in her second phase? I know some people get pretty upset about lore disagreements, so I'll try my best to fairly represent both sides. Melania needs three blooms to become a goddess. Obviously, her fight with Radon was one of these blooms, and her phase transition is another. So, where would the third be? There's a collection of petals near Melania's boss room, but a set of clothes matching the ones worn by Millicent and her sisters is found by the same spot, leading to the belief that this just belongs to one of Melania's children. Her second phase is also called the Goddess of Rot, but after her death, you get the message Demigod Felled instead of something like God Slain. But another few points for the third bloom theory is that Melania performs additional blooms in her second phase, and a couple of item descriptions suggest that her physical wings have been seen even before her fight with Radon, and she somehow already knew that stabbing herself would be the key to ending that fight. Personally, I think Melania's phase transition is slightly more likely to be her third bloom rather than the second, but there's one other interpretation of events that I think should be considered. Melania has one pretty interesting piece of unused dialogue. She calls you her dearest companion, but is willing to defend someone else's last drop of warmth with her own life. This is by no means a concrete theory, but let's consider the possibility that Melania's attack against Radon was only her first bloom. Instead of Finlay carrying her to the Halic Tree, she instead wakes up in the Swamp of Aeonia, missing her armor and having no memory of her past. This would line up perfectly with Millicent's quest, leading to her second bloom after her journey with her throughout the Lands Between. Now, with her memories returned, she discards her old clothing and dons her armor once more. Which, of course, leads to her battle where she blossoms into the Goddess of Rot. I think this all would have been really cool to see, but ultimately, it's all up to your own interpretation, and I'd love to hear your thoughts on what you think of this. At this point, you might be asking, where is Mikla during all of this? I heard speculation Mikola embedded himself in the Halic Tree, but before he could finish, Someone cut the tree open and absconded with his infant form. Perhaps the Queen's sorrow was justified. Let me remind you that Mikola and Melania weren't the only demigod twins, and the Omen twins, Morgat and Moog, actually preceded them. While Morgat was ashamed of his Omen curse, the reason behind his misshapen, horned appearance, Moog actually came to embrace it. This was thanks to an outer god called the Formless Mother, who is also sometimes called the Mother of Truth. When Moog stood before her, deep underground, his accursed blood erupted with fire, and soon after, he assumed the title of the Lord of Blood. Now, Moog's followers support the coming of his new dynasty, and whether you cooperate with them or find a secret way gate, you'll be able to find where Moog is hidden away. Oh, so that's where the so-called Lord of Blood was hiding himself, eh? A fitting little squat for that deluded maniac to bleat about the revival of his precious dynasty. Let him stay there. That way, his delusions will remain as they are, distant and unattainable. But perhaps it's worth looking into. If what I've heard is right, then maybe. At the center of the underground mausoleum lies the cocoon of the Empyrean, seated on what looks like an enormous pelvic bone. In Moog's own words, render up your offerings of blood to your lord. Drench my consort's chamber, Slake his cocoon's thirst. His awakening shall herald the dawn of our dynasty. Dearest Mikola, you must abide alone a while. Welcome, honored guest, to the birthplace. Of our dinner. I can see it as clear as day. The coming of our dynasty. Morgwin. Ah, I see. So Mikola was with the Lord of Blood after all. That is some fine intelligence indeed. Well, I wonder what comes next. If he continues his slumber within the cocoon, all would be well. But perhaps it would be safer to destroy it. Mikola is the one thing that remains a mystery to me. Neither Gideon nor Melania seem to fully understand Mikola's situation, but there's one piece of text that implies Moog was also partially left in the dark. Wishing to raise Mikola to full godhood, Moog wished to become his consort, taking the role of monarch, 
but no matter how much of his bloody bedchamber he tried to share, he received no response from the young Empyrean. Maybe some of Megla's essence still remains as a part of the Halic Tree. According to Melania, her brother will keep his promise. He possesses the wisdom, the allure of a god. He is the most fearsome Empyrean of them all. Maybe he lives on in the world of dreams. And if you'll stick with me for one last piece of gut content, I want to say how this could have all tied into a seventh, unused ending of the game. Rico's questline ended with him discovering that Saint Trina's true identity is that of Mikola. He requests entrance into Mikola's dream so that when he transcends from Empyrean to God, there will be a place for Rico at his side. The husk in the Halic Tree still seems to retain some of Mikola's spirit, and in some of Melania's unused dialogue, it was a drop of dew that she was trying to defend. Finally, in the unused text files, there's an entire paragraph spoken by an unspecified character, but is placed immediately after the other six endings. Young seedling, young seedling, return to the bosom of the earth. But remember well, thou art mine. So shall I give of myself, this is for thee, mine abundance, my drop of dew. Quench thy thirst throughout thy frame, blossom and burgeon, time and again, grow larger, stronger, until the day cometh when thou canst share in my dream. Elden Ring, O oh, Elden Ring, beget order most elegant from my tender reverie. If thou covetest the throne, impress my vision upon thine heart. In the new world of thy making, all things will flourish, whether graceful or malign. So yeah, as far as I'm aware, these are all the major plot points of Mikkel and Melania's story. There's definitely some room for interpretation, so I'd love to hear your thoughts on the topic as well. Also, I would appreciate any sort of interaction with this video, including likes, comments, and of course subscribing if you want to see more content like this. That way I won't have to do like Raid Shadow Legends sponsorships or something. Anyways, thank you so much for watching, and I'll see you next time.